Praise the Lord. Let's see the witness of his word tonight. Open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 4 to 11 tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 to 11. We're talking about the pursuit of greatness, and that's what now Solomon is going to examine in his life, his own personal greatness. Verse 4, he said here, I made my works great. Boy, that's a modest guy, huh? I built I build myself houses and planted myself vineyards. Verse 5, I made myself gardens and orchards and planted all kind of fruit trees in them. I made, verse 6, myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I inquired male and female servants, and I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. Verse 8, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of the king and providence. I acquired male and female singers to delight the sons of men and musician, uh, musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all those who were before me in Jerusalem. And he says here in verse 9 at the end, and also my wisdom remained with me, the wisdom that God had given him. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labors, and this was my reward from all my labors. Then he comes to this conclusion again. Then I looked at all the works that I had made under my hands and done, and on the labors in which I had toiled, I indeed, he says here, and indeed all was, there it is, vanity and grasping at the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Father, thank you for these words that we have, words of a man who's, who's resetting his life. And he takes an extensive amount of time in verses to to talk about his perceived greatness, things that he did, and his pursuit of greatness without relent. He just totally did it and went for it all the way. So, Father, help us come to this verse 11 resolve as we've been looking at this over and over. Help teach us, Lord, how we need to keep in check and you in check in whatever great things you would allow us to do. May we never forget you are greater. So speak to us through your word. We give you all the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Solomon talks here about the pursuit of greatness, his pursuit of greatness. You see, he says, I, 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 I made, I built, I had, I, it, it was, it was something that he made decision to do. I think more than anything, I tell you, boy, the, the, the thinking, the wrong thinking in Christianity is that we, we have some kind of force that we can move with intention, you know, that if I can just, if I, if I can just believe it, then I can receive it. I remember that kind of stuff being on bumper stickers and T-shirts and stuff. And it was that kind of attitude thinking, and, and a lot of it was derived from, from statements like this, totally wrong, totally misinterpreted. But you and I need to come to this resolve. And we see this now. This is about the third time we see Solomon come to this vanity, grasping in the wind kind of resolve. But he does it with something that all of us are challenged with. And that's we all within us have this pursuit to do great things. To do things that will be recognized. We, we all enjoy the trophies, the accolades, the recognition. We all want that. And there is perspective that's given very clearly in the New Testament. We'll look at it when we close here. 
And, and we already know this perspective. But Solomon had to learn it the hard way. He had to learn it when he came to this place in verse 11. But he begins in verse 4 with this just this endless pursuit of trying to find satisfaction and significance in the things that he achieves, in the things that he inquires, the things that he has. And he mentions even two times. He says, and I got more of this than anyone else ever had in Jerusalem. Man, he's comparing himself to them. And it's something that this flesh will do if it goes unchecked. This flesh will always want to be one up on you, one over on the other person. And you and I know that through the teachings of our Savior Jesus, we, we move another way. We move another way. Pursuit means a quest or search. It means something that is aimed for. It is consciously, deliberately. It's intentional again. It's, it's aimed for. That is what we desire, what we go for. It's only the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit, Lord, I was praying about this tonight. It's only the Holy Spirit that keeps us in check when it comes to self-ambition. Now, Solomon ain't saying anything bad against hard work. No, he said a lot in Proverbs about the, the blessings of diligent effort. But this diligent effort only works when it comes in total surrender to God. It's letting him be great. We sung tonight, we sung two songs tonight that, that tell God that he is great. He is greater. He's, he's bigger. And you and I need to come to that very thing of realizing that. And like Solomon, we have to probably realize it over and over again, that the contributions or the things that I, I, that come from these hands out to the world have to always be checked by the Holy Spirit. And all glorification given to God. It just works that way. It works that way. Proverbs 5.23. Proverbs 5.23, Solomon, by the way of the Lord, gets this understanding. He says, he's talking about people who end up ruining their lives. That's the context of this verse 23 of Proverbs 5. And he said, he will be a person. Look what he says. He shall, he shall die. He shall prematurely die is what he's saying. For a lack of instruction. Solomon is saying that, that people will, will find their, their death hastened when they don't give in to what is true, pure instruction. And we have that instruction from the word of God. There's only one commandment to children in the Ten Commandments. That is one with a promise. And the promise is if, if you obey, you, re, you obey your mother and father, you show them respect, then your days shall be long on the earth. That also goes with all of us showing respect for God, our eternal parent, Father in heaven, and, and us complying to his ways promises longevity. Longevity right up until the time where God says he wants us to come home. But Solomon says here, man, a person is going to die. He's only going to die for a lack of instruction in his life. And look at the last one. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. He says here in this greatness of his folly, the greatness of him trying to perceive greatness that becomes folly, becomes something that's foolish, something that's almost laughable. In, in the greatness, his pursuit of greatness will bring him to folly. And that folly, he says here, he shall go astray, go astray, off course, away from what is good, away from what is right. You and I have to let the Holy Spirit keep us a check in Proverbs 5.23 and keep us checked at that. Because I easily will, sad to say, and, and, and we need to take it soberly, I, I can hasten my life prematurely and lose my life prematurely if I don't move in the instruction of God but I will go astray from everything that God wants me to have and everything he wants us to have individually if, if I don't let the Holy Spirit check this pursuit of greatness. Me wanting to be self-sustained and self-glorified. Me wanting to get glory for stuff. Jesus said it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in our heart will come out of our mouths all the time. 
I don't, I'm not checking this or playing this against what Jesus says, but I think Facebook works the same way. On the abundance of the heart, they'll put it on Facebook or Instagram. And I've seen people, I've seen Christians, I know most of my friends are Christians. I see Christians put stuff and I say, wow, wow. And not to be judgmental, not trying to be self-righteous, but just being one who assesses where is God getting any glory in this post you just made? And the fact is, he's not getting any glory in the post. We, we give it to ourselves and we tally the likes and the loves and the comments that will people say, right on, good for you, good for you. And no one says glory to God. No one says praise the Lord in the midst of that. And, and you and I in our flesh, and this goes for all of us in our flesh, I will let that keep going unchecked by the spirit. I'll let you praise me. I'll let you glorify me. I'll let you like me and love me on Facebook. Because my flesh wants that and likes that. And it will lead us astray. It will lead us astray. We sung the song. Our first song tonight was he has done great things. And boy, he's done great things. And you and I need to see those great things that he does. And live in the midst of that. And live in the in the confines of that and not letting ourselves stray away from anything that's of his, his glorifying greatness and realize that all we do, we only can do it because God helps us do it. God helps us do it. Let's look at the verses here. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 4 to 6. 4 to 6 gives us a warning, and we're told, to, we're told here, or we can see here in these in these three verses, four, five, and six, is that we need to be aware of the works of our hands. Aware of the works of our hands. Solomon starts out with houses he built and, and vineyards he plants and orchards he grows trees in. He starts with this, this list of things of what he does. And it's not anything against agriculture. It's not anything against that. No, it's just the heart that this man is putting in it. Verse four, I made, I build. Verse five, I made. He says here, verse 5, I plant it. Verse 6, I made myself water pools. The man is on this rant, if you would, about stuff that he's done. Not literally for Solomon, probably he had slaves to do it. We see his servants there. He had other people to do it. But he's taking full credit for all this stuff. And it would be for us, it kind of speaks to us things that are, that are built and plan it, not always just literally, it might be the case, but not. But no, just things that I, I bring into, into the life, into my life, things that I do. Um, the pride of, of things self-made, the pride of things self-made, the pride of me, me having the ability to alter something or fix something or present something. It even, it, it, we talked about it before, it, you'll see in the male gender more of that, I think, in the, than in the female gender. Men, 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 will, men will push each other around to try to get the fix, try to fix something on, and, and, and make it work. And it's just within us to have that. And a lot of it, man, we need the Holy Spirit to kind of, guys, bring us to a sense of, of humility in that kind of thing. Because I, I always have it in me, not, not just to fix something for the good of it being fixed, but I fix it for the greatness that I can achieve. Solomon is just ranting, going over and over again about things that he had done, things that he had done. I started a little photography club. You heard about it. We well, Christians here at this church and some people outside the church. And, but just Christians getting together. And, and, and I felt, and I know it was from the Lord, I felt that I, I, I can't make this some kind of, because like any kind of art, photography can be art, and in any kind of art, you can get a little cocky about it. My photo's better than yours, you know, kind of thing. And, and, and we can end up in that kind. That wouldn't be a club. That wouldn't be any kind of fellowship. That would be just contests. And that would cause contention. And the Lord just impressed on me, on my heart, even before we had our first meeting, is that we, we have one, one essential rule in our, in our photography club, and that is that, is that we believe, we believe any, 
any photographs, any images, any shots that we capture in our cameras, they're given to us by God. So right from the start, we have nothing to say, nothing to be glorified, because it's God that's given us the image. It's God that's given us the light. You know, outside when we're doing some kind of landscape photo or something. It's God who grew the flower. It wasn't us. And right away, there's this rightly giving over to God and not factoring anything of our hands doing except clicking the shutter and saying, wow, glory to God. Glory to God. Every, every, everything should, should be that way in our lives. Anything good and perfect should understand that I, I get this from God. I have this from God. It's from the Lord we're able to do this thing. I think about my, my vocation. I, I, I have the only vocation in the universe where if you do something good and you present something well, you can't take credit for it. You better give the glory to God. Now, the plumber, he ain't got to do that. The plumber doesn't necessarily have to say, praise God, I got that fixed. Stop that leak. Or the doctor who takes out the cancer or, or, or whoever does something, some, something that's done, a woman doing something in her job. But when it comes to Christian stuff, not just me, but also you, the things that you do good and those things that you and I do for the glory of God, he needs to get the glory not us. We, we would never be right that we get the glory. It's being aware of the works that come from our hands. It's on the screen. It's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. The writer of Hebrews is explaining the, the superiority of Jesus and also the things that are coming and understanding those things are different than the things that are here on the earth. Look what he says here. But Christ, he came as high priest of the, look what he says there, of the good things to come. There are things to come. There's eternal life in heaven and oh to come and, and we should see those things good. Those good things to come. And with look what he says here, and with greater and more perfect tabernacle. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle or place, dwelling place. Is that we're, there's going to be a greater and there's also going to be a more perfect place where we're going to reside. In the tabernacle. Now he describes this tabernacle. Look what it says here. Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. He uses the, the, the metaphor that the things that are good and great and perfect from God, like, like where we're going to abide with God in in heaven, it ain't made with these hands. That means it's not of this creation, he says there at the end of the verse. It's not of this creation. You and I should always live in that kind of perspective, that I want to seek those things that are made by God. I want to seek, seek those things that God has touched. I want to always be aware of and, and always keep in my scope, the understanding that the things that are eternal are made by God. And, and I want those things, and we want those things in our lives. So verses 4 to 6, beware of the works of the hands. Verses, verse 7, we need to be aware of. He says here, things that we acquire. He says in verse 7, I acquired male and female servants. And also I had, had some of them born in there. So it sounds like they're guinea pigs or something. They're getting born, you know. They're getting born in my house or something. Like he's raising people. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all those who were in Jerusalem before me. He, he, we got to be careful of the things that we acquire the things that we accumulate, um, the stuff that we have. Um, he, he's right here saying that his greatness is not only in the things that he makes, verses 4 to 6, but also the things that he's gotten, like servants, like herds, like the flocks. And, and then he assesses it with, it's more than anyone else I know around here. I got a lot more. I've inquired a lot more. Oh, how we need to be careful. I need to be careful because I can easily do that. I'll do that not only with just tangible stuff, 
I'll do that with just, just status. I'll do that with education. We're all tempted to do that in all kinds of various ways. And Solomon now just runs amok on this kind of thing. And now he's going he's gonna to think that this kind of stuff, verse 7, is the kind of stuff that should make him feel significant and satisfied. But he realizes in verse 11 it doesn't. It's on the screen, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, For who makes you different from another Corinthian church? He says, you guys are acting like you're not like regular people. Then he says this, and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did not indeed receive it, why? Do, if, you, if you did now did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? He's talking about all the things that come by God into their lives as church. And you and I as Christians, all the things that we recognize that come by the hand of God, they don't come by the fact that you and I acquired them. I got them. Hey, look at me. I'm great. I'm stacking up on this stuff. No, you and I should know that every good and perfect gift, as the Bible says in the book of James, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, comes from God. It, it, it is healthy for us spiritually, and it's totally holy right for you and I to make sure that we give God the glory for what he's given us in life. And never bow to this. I, I've been, I acquired it. I have it. And, and that's where Solomon, many years of his life, lived in verse 7. Lived there in verse 7, thinking that's what he was. But we know, we know that everything we have good and perfect, we received it. We received it from God. Verse 8, we need to beware of riches. I know nobody in this room is rich, so you, we can just pass that. Go to verse 9. No, I'm just kidding. We can be, you can be rich because you want to be rich, huh? You have a desire to be rich. And you want to have a dime. But he talks about in verse 8, the silver, the gold. And he even talks about the singers. And he has singers, man, that are making other people happy. So people want to come and hear, who, who's Solomon going to have singing today? <laughs> he, so the man had some kind of concerts going on there at, this, at his house. And he's drawing people in for that. But he, he, so he puts the singers in with the gold and the silver. And, and you and I need to be aware of just even the things that would be considered riches in our lives. We got to be careful. We all have to have that personal check in our life. And it's a personal check. It's something only the Holy Spirit can do. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm always going to lean toward the love of money. I'll, I, I, don't, I don't need any help to do that. I'll just do that naturally. If I go and check, I'm going to love some money. I'm going to want some money. And, and that's why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You bet it is. Money's not, the love of it is. And having that desire depresses us that way. It's on the screen, it's Job 36, 19. This is one of Job's friends talking to Job because Job is pretty rich. He ain't rich now. It's funny, the man saying this to him in chapter 36, he ain't rich now. He's lost everything. But he brings the point up. He says, will your riches, Job, or your mighty forces, what he's talking about, mighty forces. Well, Job, probably his, his security team or something that he had. Because <laughs> Job had a lot of stuff, and he would have had, he would have had people that would, would have been protecting that stuff, but he doesn't have none of that now. But the, the question still goes, will your riches keep you, look what he says there, keep you from distress? And the answer is no. No, it won't. Your riches won't keep you from the distress of life. And that usually is a, is a pit that people who have a lot of resources, that's a pit that they find themselves in, and they can't believe it. Can you imagine waking up one morning, and, and you have everything. You have everything. You have everything you want. You bought it. You got it. And now you're so dissatisfied with life because you ain't got nothing else to do. Michael was like that. Michael Jackson was like that, man. You see that boy go shopping on that shopping street spree he went into in Las Vegas, man. Just lost his mind. Didn't have any money. Give me that. Give me that. Give me two of those. Give me that. Oh, man. Yeah, the kids are like that. And he's just going. 
And here's a man, he's like, you're looking at that man, he should be ashamed of that. But he's, he was always trying to achieve in his richest satisfaction. He only found distress. He only found distress. And we see that with, with common people who don't factor God into it. In this case, we see Solomon. He's going to try to think that these things can satisfy him and bring significance, but he found out they don't. And, and he goes through in a very extensive list here in verse 8. So whether it's someone who, anyone that has a lot of something and tries to, to now let that money describe or say who they are, is going to have struggles. We, we need God's help to help us hold money. Because if I don't hold my money, it's going to get a hold on me. And, and boy, it, it can. And I ain't never had a lot of money. Never. But I, but I know, I remember times that the money held me and not me the money. And there was this sense of trying to, to display something in my life. Due to the money. You know what that's like. We've all been there before. In verses 9 and 10, he deals with the, the fact of pride of greatness. And we need to beware of the pride of greatness in verses 9 and 10. He goes to things. Look what he says. I become great and excel more than them all, he says there in verse 9. He keeps on talking. He says, also, also I had wisdom. Or I, 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 I had wisdom remained with me. He said, I was smart, he's saying. He goes on and says, whoever's my eyes, what, excuse me, whatever my eyes desire, desire not kept from me. They weren't kept from me. He says they always were there. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. That's scary, huh? He goes on and says here, for my heart rejoiced in all my labors. He says, I, I, was, I was happy doing this kind of thing. And why he was happy was there at the end there of verse 10, the last line of verse 10. And this was my reward from all my labors. What was his reward? That is, his heart kind of rejoiced in it. He was saying at the time, not now. We have verse 11, but not now. He's, at this time, he was dealing with the fact that he was rejoicing and, and was all getting that earthly reward. That earthly reward. And all of us, all of us, again, like we talked about in the beginning of all this, all of us will become slaves to an earthly appreciation. And that is something you and I have to always be detaching ourselves from, and only God's help helps us do that. Remember in Matthew 6, 2, Matthew 6, 2, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said this about when you're doing charitable deeds. He says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, man. Look at me. I'm giving to the, to the uh, homeless ministry. Look at me. I'm giving to the food pantry. Look at me. I'm giving my offering in the box over here. And these guys would like just let people know, ooh, wow, look at that. They're giving. And, and they, were, they were hypocrites, Jesus says, for they do this kind of thing in the church, the synagogue but also in the streets, in public. And, it, and he says the reason that they do it, look at the next line, that they may have glory from men. And boy, that is something that always has to be made check in our lives, is that we would think that we need that glory from men. And it will cause us to do weird stuff. Closing line here in Matthew 6, 2, but surely I say to you, they have their reward. See, Solomon said also in verse 10, I, 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 I have my reward from all my labor. I have my reward. Jesus says here, you and I will have our rewards if we do them to be seen by people, to get glory by men. And that's just the very thing that Solomon was doing. Lastly, verse 11, then we're done. We see the pursuit of greatness and it's reset. We see him reset. We've seen him do it before. It's not something we're, we're only in chapter two, but we've seen him do this a few times now. He says, then I, we talked about this before, I looked. 
I looked, I perceived, I not only gazed, I, I examined something. See, that's the reset. That's the beginning of the reset. That's the beginning of the change, is that he looked on all the works that my hands had done and all the labor in which I had toiled. I looked at all that stuff he talked about in verse 4. I, I looked at the, the hand things I did with my hands, but also things that I've done in my toil, things I work for, building stuff, accumulating stuff. And he says, and indeed, all was, we heard it before, vanity means empty, and then all was grasping at the wind means I was never getting anything of substance when I was doing this. There was no significance. There was no sense of gratification or real good, righteous gratification. I was always just like chasing the wind. It was empty. It was empty in his heart, and it was non-gratifying in his soul. And there thus lies the reset. He comes to this conclusion at the end of verse 11. There was no prophet under the sun, he says. There's no prophet under the sun. You and I want to be great in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the realm of God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is among you. That means it's here on earth. It's invisible. But, but Jesus said that we press into it, we take it by force. Jesus also said we seek first the kingdom of God in all his righteousness. There's a kingdom that you and I involve ourselves in now, a realm of God that we involve ourselves in now, a place, our dimension of God that you and I want to move in. And it's a kingdom. He told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. It's amazing. I'm going to give you the access, Peter. The keys just mean access. The access into the kingdom. And all of us get the keys. We get keys. And the keys is the word of God and how the word of God has worked in our lives. And then there's open doors or open access to us because of those keys. We want to be great in this, in that dimension. Not this dimension that we normally are in. And that's the dimension of this world. And this world, as the Bible tells us, is, is puppeted by Satan himself. You and I want to be in the kingdom of God. And we want to be great. In, in Matthew 18, 4, the disciples came up to him and said, who's going to be great in your kingdom? Because they wanted to be great. It wasn't only John and James, man. It was all, all those guys who wanted to make sure they were great. And their misconception of the kingdom was also the kingdom was something that was going to come when Jesus got on a white horse and overthrew the Romans and stuff like that. But they would come to the understanding of it later on. But, but Jesus says here in, in Matthew 18, 4, when they asked the question, who would be great? Who's going to be the great? In your kingdom. Therefore, whoever, he says here, humbles himself as a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever comes, humbles himself, or whoever humbles himself as a, as a little child. One, one of the, no doubt, things we wouldn't disagree with is that a child, a little child, starts changing when they get bigger. But when they little, they have no problem understanding their limits. And they, they humble themselves in lifting their hands up to a, to a parent who will pick them up. They have no problem crying at night in the dark. They have no problem asking for more of something because they have, they have conditioned to and have accepted that they, they can't do it without help. That's probably the primary understanding where to get here from Matthew 18, 4, is that there needs to be a humility within all of us because when we get older, we get prideful. When we get older, we get like Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 
verses 4 to 11. See, that's what happened. I started saying, I, this is what I have. I got more than other people. And the list just goes on. And it's everything contrary to what Jesus is asking you and I to be here. But he says here that if you humble yourself that way, you, you would be the greatest. Solomon wanted to be the greatest. He ranked himself and compared himself with other people in Jerusalem. But Jesus says here, you want to, the ones that are to be the greatest in the kingdom is those who are totally devoted and dependent, knowing their need for God. Knowing their need for God. And realizing that he is, he is the greatest. He is the greatest. Oh, that God would always bring us to that. And over and over again. Because I'll step out and become like Ecclesiastes 2, 4, 11. I'll, I'll step out on that just immediately. Something will cause me to just move that way. And I need to reset again in verse 11. I need to reset again and realize this is vanity and this is grasping at the wind. And there's not going to be any profit in this, Solomon says. I'm not going to profit by this. This is not going to work out for my good. And thank God for his mercy and for his grace and for his faithfulness in our lives. That he'll take us back every time and give us a reset. We can do a reset. Even when we've been moving in that kind of pride we just saw here tonight. May God be merciful to us in his gracious love for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bow our heads, huh? Let the Holy Spirit affirm just this truth tonight, just what, we, what we've seen, Lord. Let the Lord do that. Let the Lord just give place by way of his spirit, the truth of his word, because all of us have to identify with this personally. I wish we could do it as a group. I wish we could do it collectively, but we can't. It's an individual decision to humble ourselves like a little child. I got to do it myself. I do it under his mighty hand and with the help of his spirit. But I have to initiate this humility. We all have to do it ourselves. Let the Holy Spirit bring us to that. That's our prayer tonight. And Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you so much for your goodness and grace and greatness because we need to always see you great and not us. Help us, Lord, to, to move in greatness in giving you greatness and glory. Not ever thinking what we do or what we acquire or what we achieve or what we've done. May it all just be given to you. Whatever we get to do, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. Help us to live that reset way. Thank you for the book of Ecclesiastes because it's reminding us of this kind of stuff. Stuff that we need. Stuff that we need you to help us to apply. So wherever we go from here, wherever life takes us from here, Lord, we are confident and assured that you are with us and that you will go before us. And you, Lord, will give us your perfect will in our lives. So May it become easy for us to say, your kingdom come, your will be done. Thank you, Jesus, for our salvation and our trust in you that secures our eternal life. Eternal life is not made with hands, but made by you. May God bless us and keep us. And may again he comfort the people in, in Florida now and be with those in the midst of this destructive storm. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless your hearts. Have a great rest of the week. Let's stand.